G'day legends and welcome to the Cricket Mentoring Podcast. I've got a fantastic guest here with me today, John Wells. Wellsy, welcome to the Cricket Mentoring Podcast. Pleasure to be here. Wellsy's on the back of an awesome Big Bash tournament. He's the talk of the nation at the moment and those of you that don't know John Wells, you must have been, I've said this before, but you must have been living under a rock. Wellsy has played 56 first class matches with three centuries and a high score of 120, 32 list day games, 91 2020 matches. He has the sixth most runs in BBL history and he's coming off the back of being the third leading run scorer in this current Big Bash tournament. So how's things, mate? It must be all a bit different being back in Perth and back to normality after the Big Bash. Yeah, um, yeah, it was a fantastic seven weeks, really enjoyable and um, like you said, back to reality now, back in Perth, back in the office at Icon Sports over here. So um, yeah, back into club cricket and Hopefully, a uh, big few weeks ahead. Awesome. Well, we're going to get into the Big Bash a bit more later on, but we'll take you back to the start, where it all began. You're born in Hobart, you're Tassie boy through and through, but what age, what's your earliest memory of playing cricket? Um, probably, probably being around six, seven years old, I guess being in the backyard watching, watching the Aussie boys on telly. Um, didn't have a brother, would have loved a brother growing up, but um, yeah, out in the yard with dad and... Um, in the schoolyard with mates um, once you sort of you know prep grade one was yeah the early memories so was it your father that was sort of trying to get you out to the backyard or was it you just watching TV and going come on dad let's go out and play yeah I think mainly me um, yeah like I said just watching it loved, loved sport growing up and pretty much gave everything a crack so once the cricket was on telly it was let's get out in the yard and always batting first and <laughs> um, yeah just Probably more so me pushing it rather than the old man. And what, what's your first memory of your first? What's your memory of your first competitive game? Um, I can remember first club game. Um, it wasn't a great memory. Uh, it was really keen. I think I was twelve years old playing under fifteens um, for the mighty Clarence Roos down in Hobart, and uh, at that stage thought I was an all rounder, but more more of a bat. And <laughs> I think I batted at three and. I got a pair, so it didn't, didn't, didn't go great. We, uh, we had a young team that were in the under 15s, I guess, and a lot of my mates from school um, in that side, and I think we got rolled for 23 in the first dig. Oh, no. the, uh, the opposition piled on 350, and then it was bad again, and I thought it can't get much worse than that, and then we got rolled for 18, so <laughs> uh, tough initiation. That's a one-sided game if I've ever heard of one. Um, so what stage then did you really become serious about your cricket? When did you think cricket's something you love and something you probably want to pursue? Um, I knew I loved it from, from that first game. Obviously getting a pair is not that enjoyable, but um, yeah, I loved footy and loved cricket. So they were the two main sports, I guess. And um, yeah, probably started getting a bit more serious when I was probably 14, 15, started to get into rep teams and state Tasmania under 15s was probably the stage where I thought like, yeah, could maybe go a bit further. And what? when did you stop playing footy? Was it something that just continued until you became a professional or did you have to stop at um, a certain point to focus on your cricket? Yeah, I stopped, stopped when I was, I think, 17. So playing state under-18s, on the back of that, end of that season, I got offered a rookie contract with Tasmania. So that was when the decision was, was made, made for me. me. Yeah. yeah, it was made for me, really. Outside of being five foot tall, I think um, that probably was factor as well I was probably never going to make the footy stuff but um, well, you rate yourself as a decent footy player these days yeah no always always say I would have gone top 10 but <laughs> <laughs> um, no that was yeah it was made for me like you said and um, yeah it was exciting time to be um, you know a rookie contracted player um, getting into a professional environment yeah it's um it's a question I ask because we've got so many young athletes who follow us and and sometimes they ask questions of of pursuing multiple sports and how they should do it so everyone's got a different story different journey sometimes they have to choose themselves sometimes it's chosen for them as it was for you um you spoke about representing tassie at an underage at underage carnivals that's the first time we came up against each other me playing for the mighty northern territory up against you and your tassie boys maddie wade and brady jones and a few other good young players there how did that work were you doing well at club level and then you got selected for an under 15 team and you sort of played all the way through or how did you get into the tassie junior setup um, yeah, I think it was, I think it was in Tassie, there's north, south, northwest, 
the three regions. So they sort of pick a rep team out of the club cricket. Um, and then there's a little carnival where you go and play each other. And um, yeah, I was involved in that. That sort of started around the under 13s, I think, um, back then. And yeah, obviously did okay in that to, to progress to the state setup. And um, yeah, I was just off the back of the club and then, and then that rep stuff. Um, was, was how they picked the, the state teams. Yeah, and you've always been a batter. Um, obviously now you, you're back at Perth playing a bit of grade cricket, you, you're bowling some seamers and some leggies, literally all sorts, but you've primarily been a batter throughout your career. That's something you love doing? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, like I said, I thought I was an all-rounder to start with. and um, Even in those underage carnivals, I used to bowl a few meds here and there. and Again, bowling 115 Ks and being five foot is not ideal for a quick, so... Um, yeah, again, batting sort of chose itself, and as I sort of progressed up um, into, I guess, first grade cricket and beyond, um, there was less and less bowling and more batting. Yeah, and um, something that uh, I've just been reminded of, we were fielding in the slips together a month or so, two, two ago before that you went away for the Big Bash, and we were chatting about underage carnivals, and we are chatting about different players and games, and we were t- chatting about various things, and I... We, I brought up a carnival and I said, oh, who got player of the carnival that, that one? And you quietly smirked and went, oh, I did. <laughs> so you obviously did really well at most of those underage carnivals. Is there anything that stands out from those underage carnivals for you? Um, again, it was a tough initiation. I, um, I can remember my first, in, my first innings for Tasmania in the under-15s. I was batting at three, come up against Queenslanders. Um, and again, I, th- I think I got knocked out of the first rock. And it was a golden duck, <laughs> and I can just remember the coach came into the rooms as I was, I was obviously shattered, devastated, and um, taking the pads off, and he sort of come up and said, "Welcome to state cricket." And I thought that's a bit harsh, but yeah. uh, missed the next game, and um, that that carnival was actually rain affected. So I think my under fifteen, my first representative carnival went thirteen runs at an average of four point three three. So um, <laughs> only ways up from there. Exactly. So um, yeah, then. Oh, I guess coming off the back of that, I was luckily to be selected in the under-17 carnival the next year. I um, performed well through all the trial games and um, that's when it really probably kicked off. I, I opened the batting in that carnival and did well and um, yeah, sort of did, did pretty steadily in the underage carnivals and from, from that point on. Yeah, and I think the one you got played the carnival, you took a few wickets as well. And off, my memory of you is just anything short, you just murder, cut and pull. Um, we had some good battle, well, not so good battles, Tazzy I think did us most times, but um, so transitioning from junior cricket into grade cricket, you said um, earlier you, you debuted at 15 in first grade in Tassie, how was that transitioning going from, from kids to men? Um, yeah, it was, I can remember it, it came about reasonably quickly, um, played year of under 15s, year under 17s um, and did alright and then second grade for probably like a half a season before the under 17 carnival um and i had a had a good carnival i think it was the one where i got the player of the series so then they straight after that they they pretty much rushed me in so i was i think i was 15 15 and a half you know turning 16 um and yeah it was sort of thrown into that and um yeah it was a big transition it was you know even the jump from second grade to first grade um, at that stage was, was really noticeable and all of a sudden playing against cricketers that you'd seen on telly representing Tassie, um, you're facing those types of bowlers so um, yeah, being at that stage like I said I pretty much only had a cut shot um, to work with so my game was all, all around defence and um, batting time really. Well yeah. you've still got a good cut shot as anyone who watched the Big Bash would know. Um, then you, you spoke earlier about getting a rookie contract with Tasmania um, and that was obviously on the back of some grade performances and your underage stuff and them seeing the potential in you. How was it walking into Cricket Tasmania on day one with, with the likes of Tim Payne and Ricky Ponting and those guys as, you, as you're now teammates? Yeah, it was yeah really exciting time. Um, I think I was pretty lucky to pick up the rookie contract when I did. Um, that early I was sort of you know, I think I think I probably picked up the last contract, and it was it was more of a project type thing at the time. They they saw some potential there and thought, let's get him in, and um, yeah, try and develop him by being in the squad over the next couple of years. So um, Matt Wade was on the same year I was, so that was good. I'd played all my underage stuff with him, um, so that probably helped as well having someone that you knew pretty well. Um, 
but yeah, obviously some very good players at that time, and, and that was sort of around the time of a successful year in Tassie cricket. Yeah, absolutely. And the next transition, I suppose, is, is from grade cricket and second 11 to shield cricket, first class cricket. You made your debut um, at 20 years old against a, a very good New South Wales side, um, run out for four in the first innings, um, and then made obviously, by judging by the scorecard, a very gritty 46 in the second innings off 145 balls. Um, batted with the current test captain Tim Payne for a while. What's your memory around your, t- your first class debut? I can remember getting run out, which wasn't great. Um, both batters at one end, but um, yeah, I was, I was quite nervous. Um, first ball, I think we were batting. We must have batted second, I think, because we it was late in the day, and Doug Bollinger was steaming in with with the new ball, opening the batting. So um, yeah, it was it was tough work. First innings didn't go as well as I would have liked, but. Um, yeah, it was a really low-scoring game and managed to bat for, for a long period in the second innings when it was quite tough. So, um, yeah, I was pretty happy to, to bat for that long and we ended up winning that game against the good New South Wales team. So, um, yeah, first taste, having a win in your first game was, was really special and, um, yeah, I was hoping it was going to be the kickstart of a, a long career. Now... On the back of the Big Bash, you, you'd be known in households around Australia for your dynamic stroke play, your ability to get off strike, your running between the wickets. Um, but going back to that innings, you were gritty, you batted a long period of time, you've had sort of a lot of innings like that throughout your career. What would you? What sort of a player were you growing up? Were you a stroke player or were you someone who would just dig in and try and bat time and your, your strokes have evolved and your sort of shot selections evolved as you've got older? Yeah, no, definitely... Definitely a grinder. Um, just, I, I was probably hard to get out, but limited, I'd say. Um, and that's, I think, well, back then, being being one of the smaller kids, not as strong. Um, you relied on pace on the ball to, to score, so that's where the cut shot came in. But um, yeah, I mean, I can remember that first shield match. Um, obviously, being exposed to. to Facing some bowlers and different tactics that you, you've never come up against. I had Nathan Bracken coming around the wicket, you know, hooping him back in, which I'd obviously never never faced anything like that. So um, I can remember in that innings, I was just pumped to be out there and I was just like, I'm just going to bat as long as I can and they're not getting me out type of mindset. But um, yeah, like you say, as the years have gone on and you're in the system, you know, you have big lengthy pre-seasons where you work on weaker areas and try and try and become a more complete cricketer, I guess, and develop new, new shots. And um, yeah, it was just something that came along the way. And if you had it said to me back then that T20 would be my best format, and um, yeah, I, would have, I wouldn't have believed you, that's for sure, because it was quite the opposite back then. Yeah, well, I think it's a great lesson for any youngster out there that maybe is smaller or not as strong as some of the other guys or doesn't score as quickly that if you just keep putting in the work, you set your foundations for your game, you can evolve and expand as you get older. And who knows what your next sort of steps are in your career, but you're now one of the best 2020 players in Australia. And coming from where you came from, a smaller sort of guy when you were younger, to what you are now is just inspiration, I think, for all young players out there who may feel like that their shots are limited or they can't score quickly. And it's something that I often say to young players is, you've got your foundations right, you've got your game to a certain point, you've got your groove, you've grooved your shape and your technique to a certain point, it can evolve over time and certainly you're an example of that. Um, moving from there, you've, you've, played a, you've played a fair bit of cricket for Tassie, you're in the white ball team, you're in their, t- their four day team, you played a lot of cricket for them. You then sort of finished up with Tassie, what was that, how was that, you lost your contract there and how was the transition to come to Perth, what made you come over to the west after that? Um, yeah, I was. I guess being in the system from a young age, I sort of thought cricket was everything. Um, being contracted whilst at school, and um, it was school sort of took a back step, and it was I'm going to be a cricketer. Um, so I put a lot of time, and and yeah, cricket was everything. So I think um, up until the debut, and then you know I think probably had another three years before I lost my contract for the first time in Tassie. Um, that was a that was a big moment because um, you know it went from cricket was cricket was life to cricket could be done. So um, what age were you then? Do you I think I was twenty three. I think um, first time I lost it. So um, came off contract. Um, 
but base, I still thought I was good enough and had time to to make it. Um, so I stuck stuck at it. Um, trained with the squad still down in Tassie. Um, was basically a contracted player without pay. Um, and I can remember I, I got back in. And played. in that period, sorry to cut you off, in that period were you working for a living or did you just live off some savings or how were you managing um, through getting paid? Yeah, I think there was a bit of savings there and I was, I was working with my old man as a labourer, um, obviously to have that flexibility to still leave and go and train and do that whole program but still have a bit of bit of income coming in so um, yeah it was that was hard but obviously wanted to play cricket and that was the only way I saw it possible so and I think for the audience understanding that sort of aspect of or that part of your life is important because I think often they think the cricketers have an easy ride or whatever but you went through some some setbacks and you had to go away and, and to earn a living you had to go and be a labourer or something you probably yeah wouldn't normally have done and wouldn't enjoy as much but it's just what you had to do to give yourself a chance to be a cricketer yeah I, and it definitely made me appreciate cricket a lot more um coming off digging holes to all of a sudden going to train and do, do a gym session or a running session seemed pretty good so um i can remember yet yeah, chipped away and i ended up um i think i ended up picking up the last bbl contract that season which was bbl one for the hurricanes so Ended up having that as well, and then got back in the Tassie team in one day cricket. And I think I think as it turned out, I got I got upgraded with the with the system of getting upgraded the point system. There, I got back in, played a one day game, um, and didn't get many opening the batting. Um, and I think there was only one game left in the season, so I thought, well, I'm, I can't get upgraded anyway because there's only one one game left, but. Got picked for the last game, scored my first 100 um, in one day cricket. Um, we won the game and ended up making the final out of nowhere. It was a season where sort of four or five teams could make the, the one day final. So ended up making the final, scored some runs, so it was hard to leave out and, and played in the final and ended up with an upgrade that year, um, which I thought, you know, finishing with 100 and playing in a final, I thought things were getting be back on track, but missed out on a contract again the next season um, and did it all again, sort of same same story, earned an upgrade, then got back on um, for however long it was, a f two or three years, and then I lost it. In, in, that, in, that, mo in that period where you, you've played in the final, you've got the runs in the last game, and then you don't get a contract, you've obviously gone from a real high, finishing the season well, getting the upgrade, everything's going well to quite probably a low, how did you then deal with that? Did you have a few days of feeling sorry for yourself, feeling frustrated, and then thought, nah, I need to just get on with this and work hard? Or was it a long sort of dwell and, and frustration? Or how did you, in that moment when you had that real setback, how did you deal with that? I can't remember exactly, but it was it was hard because, yeah, like I said, I'd, I'd gone through it the year before. Um, a lot of hard work to get back in, then performed okay and thought I'd get back on and, and didn't get rewarded, so... Um, yeah, I guess it was another setback, um, and yeah, it was just, I was sort of brought up along the lines of, you know, hard work, work hard, and that's how you sort of earn your success, so it was, it was just about getting back on the horse and um, doing it again, and I guess it makes you hungrier to know that the next time you get an opportunity, you have to take it, um, but yeah, I think across my career, I've lost my contract four times in state cricket, so... Um, it's something I was actually proud of to come back time and time again where a lot of guys would have probably just said I'm done um, you know you've lost your contract it, it's a tough time when it, that's your dream is to to try and represent your country so when that's sort of taken away from you it's yeah a lot of guys can go the other way and just I guess feel sorry and think it's all over um, but yeah one thing I was proud of was that I kept going back putting a case by scoring runs and, and getting back in. And that's something that should inspire people all around the world listening to this is that if your work ethic's there and you want it enough, then yeah, it's up to you. If you if you get the, get the runs, take the wickets, whatever it is, there's always opportunities. Um, and so what brought you over to the West? I know you came over here without a contract. Yep. What was the communication from when you were in Tassie? What inspired you out of all the states in Australia? Why did you come over to WA? Yep, so I lost lost the contract for the third time around that, I think I was 26. Um, and that was the moment where I knew it was either the end or 
I could have a crack, but I'd have to have to make a move and, and have a fresh start, I guess. So, um, yeah, I, I looked at options of where I'd potentially move to, um, who was there, squads, opportunity, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I can remember um, at the time Justin Langer was coaching WA. Um, I'd heard really good things about him as a coach. Um, I thought that would be really good for my cricket. And um, yeah, just decided that that was the best fit for me. Um, did you have a conversation with JL or anyone at the Wacker and they sort of said, yep, come train with us and we'll see where you're at? Or did you just... Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I wasn't sort of in a position to, to just go and start from scratch. Um, big move, obviously. Um, was recently married at that time as well. So, um, yeah, it was pretty much honeymoon and move. Um, but yeah, I spoke to, spoke to JL on the phone, spoke to Adam Griffith, who was assistant coach, who I'd played with in Tassie, so I knew I had a relationship with him. And yeah, they showed genuine interest and said they were keen. Um, no spot left on the contract list. Um, they'd already sorted that for the, for the year, but they said, by all means, I'd love you to come over. Same, same sort of concept, be, be part of the squad, um, full access to everything, just no pay, basically. Um, and also I wanted to do was know that if I came across um, and scored runs that they'd consider me. Um, that was my thing. If they weren't going to consider me, I wasn't going to bother. Um, and they were like, yep, no, nah, well, yeah, if you're scoring runs, you'll get rewarded. You'll play second 11, if you score runs there, there's no reason why you can't play for WA. So um, that's pretty much all I needed to hear and um, yeah, moved across. Big move, um, but things went pretty well pretty early and, and they stuck to their word and yeah. Did you get a 100 first grade game? One of the first you No. Um, how did your season first grade how did you start with Perth when you first First, first club game, yeah, I can remember that. It was out at, out at Lilac against Midland in a one day game. Um, came across and it was 40 degrees. I think it was, a bit different was Tassie. the hottest day I've ever played of cricket, I reckon. Um, yeah, coming from Tassie where 20 is a nice day. Um, and yeah, was out in the field first, in the field for 50 overs in the heat, went out to bat, obviously keen to do well. Um, I can't remember exactly what I made, I think I got 40 or 30 odd, um, and literally was cooked, like, <laughs> hit a full toss to mid on and walked off I think, and I was like, geez, I'm, this is going to take a bit to get this. used to, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, scored 100 early for Perth. Um, did well in pre-season games for WA in the trial games and um, got selected in Futures League and, and scored a couple of hundreds to start there and just really um, kick-started things off. I um, think I actually got picked in the one-day squad, which was at the start of the season. It was off the back of the pre-season games, did well and um, got picked and that was a moment where I thought it wasn't, wasn't going to happen. I thought I was going to have to you know, graft away and it was going to be a a long process but um, yeah they rewarded with selection in the one day squad which was I can I can remember being told I was in the squad and I was like how good is this mm. um, great move great decision really really excited and then um, I think that lasted for about 24 hours because straight after that the Bangladesh test tour got cancelled and yeah, there was there was a couple of handy, oh, handy, couple of handy players coming back the marshes um, there's about four or five batsmen from WA in that squad, so they came back, knocked me out of the, of the one-day squad, and uh, yeah, had to bide my time for a bit longer. Yeah, it's again, it's an inspiring story of, of sort of not having anything but a promise of opportunity and, and moving your life to pursue your, your, your dream and your, your career. So well done on, on doing that. It's, it's inspiring for anyone watching or listening. Um, now you've dominated, absolutely dominated, grade cricket and second eleven over the years. We sort of talk about it when we're waiting to bat and whatever over the times. Um, you've scored something like 40 first grade and second 1100s, 40 plus, I should say. What's the key for you for converting starts? I know it's, it's a, there's no secret form, there's no secret recipe, but it's something a lot of people struggle with. And you've spoken about it to our group. If you can get to 40, you should be able to get to 100. You've done the hard work. What is it for you that has made you be able to score so many hundreds? Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly. I, I mean, as a batter, Batting's hard and you're going to get out early. So 
for me, it's you look at the the really good players who have good records. They score big hundreds, and you talk about turning good days into great days. And the good players do. They score two hundred, not out three hundred, two fifty, and that's hard to do in club cricket because of the time. Um, but yeah, for me, when I get in, when I feel like I'm in, and I've got to that thirty forty mark. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty angry at myself if I don't go on and get 100 because, like I said, you have days where you might cop a bad decision or you get a good one early and, um, you know, the history of cricket shows you fail, um, you know, more than more than you succeed, I guess, with, with the stick. So um, you've really got to try and make the most of it. So for me, it's once you get to that, I, I try just not to change the way I play, um, which I think is probably an area where a lot of people... They probably get a bit excited, um, Shift up the get outside of their, their game plan and outside of their bubble a bit, and that's that's what brings them undone. Whereas, you know, I've always had that sort of hunger in myself to, once I get in, to just bat all day and not give them the satisfaction of getting me out. So um, it's literally just sticking to your routine, your process, and just batting. Having a and, hunger to stay in. Yeah, and I mean, once you, once you do get to the 100, that's when I find that, that's when you can have a bit of fun if you want. You know, you've, you've got there, you've earned the right to expand a little. Normally that's later in the day and, you know, you've probably got to step on the gas a bit as well to try and score as many runs as possible for the team. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in one-day cricket, there's no better time to bat than the last 10 overs when you're in on 100. Um, and, and likewise, if you're coming in after tea with 100 next to your name um, in a club game and there's still 25, 30 overs to bat, there's... Um, yeah, that's that's happy hour. Happy days. Yeah. yeah. Now moving on to the big bash, you've obviously, as I said at the start, amazing, amazing um, tournament. Probably exceeded um, your own expectations in, in terms of how well you did, and congratulations for everything you did. I know all the Perth boys were right behind all your innings, and you being a cricket mentoring ambassador this year, we were right behind everything you were doing. It was awesome to see. What were your expectations leading to the tournament? Um, it was very different for you this year. The, probably the first year ever you weren't involved in a professional setup before yep. the Big Bash. You were out working, you were playing grade cricket, and you were left to your own devices. I know you're hitting with Scotty Muleman um, each week to get yourself ready. But what were you? What were you sort of give everyone an insight into what what it looked like in those months leading up to the Big Bash and what your expectations were? Yeah, so it was weird. Like you said, it's the first time um, not being in. A system like even when I've been off contract, I've been training with the with the state squad. So um, yeah, there was a bit of I guess nervousness and doubt there. Um, you know, I was I was confident that I'd be I'd be right um, coming off a good season last year. Um, had you know my expectations were that I'd go and perform, but um, a bit from the a bit from the outside, I guess, is that you know um, people say. It's, it's going to be the test to come out of club cricket, out of that environment, like you said, to, to then step up and be able to perform. That's the worry from, you know, other people's point of views. Um, so, yeah, there was a little bit of doubt there. And um, for me, it was, I think that's starting well in the in the BBL was really important because if I hadn't started well, that's probably when the doubts would have come in and I would have felt that um, that, that could be the case. But starting well, um, I can remember getting over to Adelaide um, about 10 days out from the start um, and that was going to be a really important block for me um, for my preparation to, to feel ready um, and I can remember I was thinking I was going to need every one of those 10 days and I can remember I think it was after my second hit in the nets I was like I'm ready to play so it actually must have been all those balls I threw to you in the last year <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah I mean I did I did, did the work leading in um, like you said hitting with yourself down at Perth, hitting with Scotty Newman once a week, that was um, invaluable for me. So, um, yeah, I think that really held me in stead and kept me ready. Um, no doubt played a big role, so. Um, and something that I think is important for you to understand is you were setting yourself high standards when you were training. You weren't, you're, you're a professional cricketer, you have been your whole sort of career since you're 18. You were setting your standards to a big bash or a professional level, not letting your standards drop. You were staying fit, you were training extra sessions, and that's what people don't see, do they? They don't see all the work you're doing behind the scenes to get you ready for the big bash when you weren't in the system. Yeah, yeah, and like you say, it's important. It's it's easy to drift. Um, you know, club cricket, 
two training Tuesday, Thursday night, seven minute hit. It's it's not a lot really. So um, yeah, have to do the do the work to feel ready. And for me, that's a big part of my preparation. It has been since I was really little. Was I like to hit balls? I like to feel ready. So when I go out to bat, I've got sort of no doubts in my prep. Um, I think the worst thing you can do is walk out to bat feeling underprepared so, or underdone. So for me, it was yeah, do the work and make sure that when I walk, walk out to bat in that first game that I feel ready. And so you, you walked out to bat, you got runs in the first game or two. How did you, something that's sort of, I suppose, really interesting, you played such a great role batting at number five and four for the strikers. How did you read the situation of the game? How did you know what a good score was if you're batting first? How did you manage a run chase if you were batting second? Because you always seemed to have everything under control and did the job, whatever the scenario. Yeah, I think it's always hard. T20 cricket, a lot of a lot of teams that I've played in the past have, you know, you'll have a what you think is a pass score, and that might come from the coach or the, the opening batters who have just been out there or whatever. Um, but we sort of went away from that, and we were basically saying we we don't want to put a cap on anything. We don't want to say oh it's a one sixty, because then you sort of bat to get one sixty. Um, whereas in T20, you just got to bat freely and. Um, try and get as many as you can so if that's that can turn into 180 um, so yeah it's, it's trying not to put a cap trying not to put a number on it but at the same time I found myself you know when you're back in probably more so up five you're coming in three down and there's not a lot of batters behind you so it's a real tricky scenario of a lot of the time you've got to rebuild and give yourself a chance um, to then go you can't generally go from ball one unless you're coming in the 16th, 17th over and you have to. Um, but it was, it was a weird situation. I found myself coming in probably around the six, seven, eight over mark a lot, um, which probably suited me because I had had more balls to, to bat. Um, gives me more of an opportunity to score runs. But um, from a team's perspective, it's, yeah, it's not ideal. It's a bit of a rebuilding phase. And then my, my role was to, to rebuild and make sure I was there for the last five overs to to be able to launch and get us to something that was competitive. So what's your game plan? And does it change regardless of the scoreboard? Like, are you going out there and from ball one, it's just about getting off strike? Do you sort of think, okay, I need a boundary every 10 balls? Or do you sort of target certain bowlers and try and get a couple of boundaries off their over? Yeah. Um, again, it, it sort of changes every game. It's um, There might be a matchup that I've you know, chosen pre-game that... I fancy that bowler. That's my best matchup, um, so that's my opportunity. Or um, a lot of the time, like I said, it's about just being clear. Um, bowlers running in, they've obviously set the field. Um, and if, if I think I can get a boundary first ball, then you've got to try and take it. Um, if not, it's sort of get off strike. Um, if there's not a ball that I think I can find the boundary. It's it's get up the other end and let the other guy do his thing. Um, and just build that way. Ideally, like to get a boundary early in my innings to to sort of get ahead of the rate um, and and sort of release that pressure. There's nothing worse than looking up at the scoreboard and you you five off ten. Um, so yeah, boundaries obviously help, but yeah, it's just about knowing knowing your plans, knowing your areas, and um, going from there. And when there were a few dot balls in your innings, whether it's early or in the middle, how do you stay focused, stay in the moment, and not panic? Um, Oh, I think that's just part of maturing as a cricketer and having that experience of having done it for a, for a long time now. Um, yeah, I mean, you do, you, you watch players play and a couple of balls, even when you're in the field, you can feel that pressure build and you can see them wanting wanting a release and that's where, you know, it, it nearly comes down to 50-50 sometimes. You see a batter take a pretty big risk um, and it either goes for six or it's out. Um, but for me, it's just, yeah, a lot of the time it's going to be harder for the guy coming in so if you've faced a few dots and that pressure has built you feel it definitely everyone's feeling it the boys in the dugout are feeling it the non-strikers feeling it um, you're aware of it but the worst thing you can do is get out there because um, that puts the non-striker and the guy in the sheds who's coming in next under under the pump so you've sort of just got to take your ego out of it a bit best sometimes the best thing to do is get up the other end just hit a single, cool a take a couple of deep breaths and go, it's okay, I'm, I'm one or two boundaries away from being back ahead or back where we need to be. Um, so, yeah, that's 
something that I've sort of learned over the journey. Um, and a lot of the time it is, it's, it's not panicking. It's knowing that, for me, I know if I'm batting a bit of time and I'm there at the end, that more often than not, we'll, we'll get enough runs. And it's a, that's a, such a great lesson for young players watching or listening that you guys can learn from John's experience. The, the 30 years of him, or the 30 years old, but the 20 years of him playing cricket, and 15 years of him playing at the top level. This is all about trying to fast track your development and learning so that when you're in a situation like that, when it's you've had two or three dot balls, it, it, you learn this with experience, but you've got the chance to fast track that is it's okay, get off strike, get up the other end, and it's going to be harder for the guy to start. So it's such great and valuable advice coming from someone at the highest level. Um, how important, with such a, such a busy schedule, um, traveling a lot, playing a lot, how important is your physical fitness, your mental fitness, and your sort of recovery and everything else you're doing other than playing? Yeah, I think, I think in the lead up, the physical stuff's really important because um, you don't get any opportunity once... Once the tournament starts, you pretty much, like you say, you play, travel, play. Training's minimal. Um, it's mainly top up where the batters will do and bowlers don't do much. Um, it's mainly about recovery once once you get underway. So um, you sort of got to get that fitness base that's going to be good enough to see you through. Um, and then it's about, for me, it's about staying fresh mentally um, and recovery. Yeah. What does recover, recovery look like for you? Is it ice bars or stretching or foam rolling or? Um, a lot of pool. I, I like to get in the pool. Um, prefer that over an ice bath. But um, yeah, ice bath, pool, that type of recovery. Um, lots of flying, so trying to wear compression and um, just those little things um, to just yeah, hopefully get a little edge and um, yeah, just basically light training, get the old body moving, running around, stretching um, the day before a game and. and Freeing, freeing up in the pool, um, just making sure that, yeah, body's as fresh as it can be to, to go again the next day. And having done so well and you were so consistent in this big bash, how did you not get caught up in your own press or the press that was being said about you and not get ahead of yourself? How were you able to stay grounded and stay focused and just ready for the next game? Um, I think, again, I think a bit of experience of, you know, you hear people talk about it and... Um, yeah, try not to read into it too much. There's obviously, you know, in cl- the club WhatsApp groups and everything, there's there's things flying around and a bit of banter and stuff. So you do see it. Um, and it's nice. It's it's always nice to read good stuff about yourself. I've read plenty of bad stuff over the years. So, um, yeah, it's nice. But at the same time, it's, it's out of your control. So for me, it was just, um, I think it was probably a good thing that games were so close to, to each other that it sort of just rolled on and, you basically, for me, it's preparing for the next game. You got a game in two days' time, so you're preparing for those that opposition, and then you're training, and all of a sudden you're out there doing it again. So um, and when you're in form, it's always nice to bat. Play yeah, exactly. Home. You just want to get back out there and, and try and keep rolling, like I said. So that was that was a really good thing. Starting the tournament well in a, in a tournament that's like that. Um, yeah, you can just sort of keep try and keep things rolling. Um, but yeah. Did, did read, did see some stuff and um, yeah, just tried not to read too much into it and knew that if anything was going to happen, it was going to be through me just keep doing what I'm doing. So yeah. that was that was the focus. And there's been, obviously, I'm referring to, there's been talk about you making the Australian T20 team or being a contender. Has anything come, obviously you didn't make it and bad luck about that. We were hoping you'd get in there, obviously, but has anything, have you heard from the Aussie selectors at all? Yeah, um, you know, we obviously spoke about it earlier. Um, yeah, there's a bit of hype, and for me, it was again, it was just not expecting anything. Didn't want to have that expectation and be disappointed. Um, knew it was always going to be an uphill battle with the players that it, you know are available for selection. So, um, yeah, interestingly enough, I, I woke up to a missed call, unknown number, the other morning, and sort of had a slight inkling that couldn't be, could it? Um, and that was 6:30 Perth time. Um, and then just sort of thought, nah, to, just a random random call. Um, and then, yeah, 7.30, another call from that number and answered the phone, half asleep. Um, and, yeah, it was Trevor Hones, the national selector. So um, for that split second there when he said who it was, I thought it could be it could be good news and I could be in. Um, 
and then obviously it wasn't to be. It was it was just a, a call with a bit of feedback and um, basically saying that they couldn't fit me in the squad and um, but they liked what I was doing and you know keep doing it. I was I was in discussions and um, yeah, unfortunately they couldn't fit me in for South Africa, so I sort of went high or low, high, high low really quickly and um, yeah, it was interesting because it was. I guess I got off the phone and I was sort of just sat there for a bit and thought that's pretty cool like I was you know I was nearly nearly there I was obviously close in, in discussions um nearly picked in a squad for Australia which has obviously been a dream since since I first picked up a cricket bat um and then to I guess think well it didn't happen um you know now what it, it could be as close as I ever get hopefully not um but then to sort of think you know, my professional cricket from here on in is, well, my next month looks like playing club cricket. Um, there's not a lot of professional cricket to, to then uh, put some runs on the board and, and try and work my way into that spot now that I don't have it. So it was, yeah, it was a weird couple of hours of just processing that and what had happened. But, um, yeah, it was really great to get a call and, and know that I was in discussions and, and get that feedback. Absolutely, I bet it was a yeah, great reward for what you did. And hopefully if there's any smart selectors or coaches out there, there'll be a few franchises or counties or something like knocking on your door very soon. Now, changing the pace a little bit, your first class career probably hasn't gone as well as you would have hoped with this, the skill level you've got. Um, why do you think you weren't, have, weren't able to transition your sort of form and your runs from first grade and second 11, where you absolutely dominated, into first class cricket? Yeah, that's. I mean, it's something that is really disappointing for me. Um, and growing up, like I've said earlier, I thought I thought red ball cricket was going to be my my go. I thought if I'm going to play cricket for Australia, I'll play Test cricket. Um, I won't play white ball cricket, and it's it's obviously done a full full 180 there. But um, yeah, very disappointed with how I went in shield cricket. Um, and I think a lot of the reasons for that was just my mentality around that. Obviously started playing red ball first um, and chipped away over the years was, was always in and out of the team through performance um, I'm not sure I think I think the most games I ever strung together was maybe nine um, so yeah I, I reckon I got dropped probably 10 times or maybe more across across my 50 games or however many it was so um, I always felt under pressure and and I think I put Expectation pressure on myself in four day cricket, whereas I allowed myself to free up in one day in white ball cricket. One day, one day opportunities limited. I think I played 30 games over 12, 12 years or whatever it was. So again, there's not much cricket there. But um, obviously in T20 cricket, I've played played a fair bit consistently, um, and just yeah, just that more relaxed, freer mindset. I think is something that. I think technically I had the aim to, to succeed and um, I think I showed that through some second eleven cricket where, like you said, I've, I've dominated. I've, I've come up against attacks that were exactly the same attacks that I've faced in first class cricket. So for me, that, that told me I was good enough um, technically, but mentally just couldn't get it right. So knowing what you do now, being a little bit older and wiser and more mature and having been out of the system for a little while, what would you say to a younger you, an 18 or a 19 year old you, 20 year old you, who's sort of making their way in first class cricket? What, what advice would you say? Um, I'd have a big em emphasis on the mental side of the game for sure. Um, it's not something that I ever trained or worked on when I was younger. Um, like I've said, I, I like to hit balls and I, I used to hit so many balls as you know, coaches I'm sure would, would tell you there's a few sore shoulders out there, but um, yeah, the mental side of the game, I didn't really know anything. I didn't know to train that um, when I was sort of 17, 18, all the way up till probably when I was about mid-20s. So that was that was a big part of when I came across the WA, I looked at that side of that side of it. And that, that's something that the last few years I've really worked worked away at. And yeah, if, if I could have my time again, I'd, I'd definitely do that. How, how have you worked out your mental side of the game? Is it just about relaxing and having other things in your life going on? Or what have you done visualisation or meditation or journaling? Or what sort of techniques have you used to expand your mindset, I suppose? Yeah, all of that. Um, basically, I guess, 
yeah, just realizing that cricket's not everything, having that balance in life. Um, I think I started playing my best cricket when I actually started working with Icon, um, you know, five, six years ago, gave me something outside of the game. Um, and like I referred to earlier, when I first got my contract, cricket was everything. So, um, and I mean, it works differently for different people, um, but I think I just put all my eggs in one basket and when it didn't work, um, it snowballed and made it worse. I, I put more pressure, more expectation to try and make it happen. So, um, yeah, knowing that, just a good work-life balance, I guess. Um, have some perspective outside of cricket. Um, just allows you to relax and not not have to know that you're walking out to bat and it's the be-all and end-all. You have to score runs. Mm. If you don't, it's just a game at the end of the day. And, um, yeah, there's plenty plenty more in life to like. So what, what drives you? What drives you now and what drove you as an 18-year-old? Um, I think it hasn't really changed. I've just always wanted to be as good as I can be. So, um, yeah, I wanted to see how far I could get in cricket. Um, and for me, like I said, one of my early coaches, um, Graham Kearney, he was known as Grizzle Guts back at Clarence. Um, he was actually the one that got me to Clarence at, at when I was 12. He, he came down and saw me playing indoor cricket for school. Um, and I think he thought this kid could be all right. And he spoke to mum who was there with me at the time and said he should come down and play outdoor cricket at Clarence. Um, and I did, I went, went across and that's where, where it started. And he was pretty much my batting coach um, from when I was 12 to, to pretty much when I was 15, 16. When I progressed to the first grade, he was still at the club. He used to look after the under 17s, but um, yeah, he basically took me um, at that stage when I started playing under 15, under 17 as a 13 year old. He took me through the through the off season when I was playing footy, and he'd hit with me once a week. Um, you know, through that whole winter um, to try and get me better, and um, yeah, I've got no doubt that he taught me a lot um, about hard work um, and discipline. Um, he was pretty old school and. Um, yeah, his his method of coaching. Um, a lot of people didn't didn't take to it really well, but but I did, and I was willing to, to work hard because, like I said, that's what I thought was going to get me ahead of the pack and, and give me the best chance. Yeah. Um, so shout out to him. And are there any other people you want to sort of thank, or any other mentors or people who have been really influential in your career? Um, obviously, parents. Um, you know, same as same as most kids driving around. Um, you know the sacrifices to, to let you play and and all that um, been a big part of it and um, yeah I've obviously had some different coaches along the way um, now working with Scotty Millman um, has been really important the last couple of seasons and yeah obviously not a lot to I guess train for being now out of state cricket but obviously to get me ready for the big bash as well that's been a big part of that so um, yeah, enjoy my Friday morning hits with Scotty, and um, yeah, there's been there's been heaps of people. Obviously, love loved having JL as a head coach and, and a bit of a batting coach mentor um, for the couple of years he was with the WA team prior to, to going across the Australia. Yeah. Now, in terms of what you do in the moment when you're batting, um, what is your in between ball routine like and what's your pre-ball routine like how do you manage your thoughts how do you get yourself in the zone and ready to face the ball so you can make the best decision and then execute your skill as best you can yeah i think that's one of the hardest things to do for a batter i think and that's something that i really struggled with particularly in shield cricket was um the ball was running in and i had all sorts of thoughts going through my head and um you know not great thoughts and that was something that i've got no doubt um led to my downfall more often than not so that was a big part of it for me was finding a way to to clear my mind and um, be able to focus on the ball um, a lot of the best players will tell you that all you need to do is watch the ball um, train so much hit so many balls that um, you just got to back your training once you're out there that you know what you've trained for all those years um, is going to allow your instincts to take over and um, you know, you, that, that's why you train, is that when you're in that situation, you react and, um, yeah, it's just about clearing my mind, so. Um, so do you have a mantra or a phrase or a saying? Uh, not really, it's changed, it's changed over time, but, I mean, sometimes I tell myself just to watch the ball. Um, that gets a bit, 
repetitive sometimes and you can tell yourself to watch the ball and you're not so yeah I might I might change it up just here and there just to keep it um, I guess new and fresh so that it's not just an automatic that's what you're saying and you're not really doing it um, but yeah I have a routine um, from the moment I walk out to bat um, once I cross the line it's the same every every innings um, and is that something that you've developed since you've got older or you've had it for a long time um, had it for a long time that um, the actual routine of walking out to bat and stuff yeah I think uh, yeah back to you know remembering my debut for Tassie I think it wouldn't have changed since since then for that for that side of it um, and then pre-ball each ball I've got a routine in between balls um, it's the same so for me it's like I said earlier it's about doing that for the first ball I face and then if I'm still there 300 balls later it's you're still doing it so and often I find that when I get out and I'm walking off it's when I haven't done my routine it's when I haven't got back into the moment and then I'm walking off and I'm out because I haven't done it and just to give everyone some context and, and sort of back up what you're saying about routines I was fortunate through coaching the NT under 19s at the Nationals in December um, our boys the NT boys and the CA boys went and watched the Australian team train and, and Buck Rogers was the coach of the CA team and he pulled JL aside and asked him a few questions and something that JL emphasised was the importance of having a routine. He spoke in detail to the two groups about how he used to do everything methodically in order and follow a specific routine. And if you don't have a good routine, you're setting yourself up for failure. So it's it's so, so important. Now, we're going to have to wrap up shortly. It's been fascinating. But what is it that you've seen in some of the best players you've played with that are common themes? You've played with Ponting and, and Tim Payne, Rashid Khan and these sort of guys, what makes them so special? What are the themes you see in the best players? Um, yeah, thinking about those couple in particular, it's work ethic and belief, I think. I think, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to play with Ricky Ponting and growing up in Tassie, he was he was my idol. Um, so I used to love it. He, he never used to play much for Tassie. Obviously, he was playing for Australia in all forms and very busy man, but every now and then he'd come he'd come down and he'd have a game for Tassie or, or whatever, or he'd be at a training session. And that was that was gold for a, for a guy who'd looked up to this guy all, all your life and, um, you know, one of the best players in the world. Um, so one thing that fascinated me about him was he he would be the last person to leave training and he would he would know everything about everyone in the room. He's a bit of a cricket nuffy. Um, but the first thing that stood out for me was I was playing first grade cricket, club cricket, um, in Hobart and the test captain would come back and he'd know how many runs had scored on the weekend and for me that was like why does he know that why, why does he even care like this is a guy who's churning out test hundreds yet he's he's still looking at scorecards and he knows if I've got runs on the weekend or if I've missed out um, and then on on the other side he was he would still be training harder than everyone and he would be there throwing balls to me if I wanted to hit balls at the end of a session, which which I thought was pretty cool. And um, that's all about him as a bloke, shows what sort of character he is really, and that's something anyone can do if if they're willing to, to do put in the work, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and then the belief side of it was like seeing him after he'd get out, you know, what what he would think about opposition and he just thought he was better than everyone else and um, he wasn't arrogant in that way but it's just for me it was the belief he had um, and the things that fortunate enough to bat, fortunate enough to play with him and bat with him out in the middle and had had a decent partnership with him in one game and he would just always talk about hitting the ball in the middle of the bat and 99% of the time he did but his, his belief in his own ability was, was something else um, you know that that really stood out to me. Um, Pain is the same. Strong, strong self belief. Really hard worker. Um, you know, he, the work he puts into his wicket keeping that I used to see when I was in Tassie is through the roof. And there's no coincidence that he's, you know, the best wicket keeper in Australia and one of the best in the world with the gloves. So, um, Rashid Khan, again, very hard worker. Um, and the thing, the thing about him is, I think he's just, he's got great energy and passion and he just wants to get better he, he's always working hard but he's, he's working on developing his game and 
new ways, different balls, different variations. Um, he's obviously playing a lot of T20 cricket and people are trying to come up with different ways to get a hold of him um, with some limited success, but he's always got you know, a slight different variation he's working on or something just to keep the batsman guessing. Mm, and that's something I've seen is the best players always are evolving. They're always tinkering and trying new things. Now, you've played under some great captains and some great leaders. We've just spoken about Ricky Ponting, but what are some traits of the best leaders you've seen? Um, I think the best leaders lead from the front. Um, there's, there's obviously people who... Um, yeah, lead by example, um, and I think that's the best way. If you're gonna, I mean, one thing is talking and, and saying things, but I think you've got to show that you've got to go out there and, and back it up yourself and, and lead the way with that. Um, and just being really honest and open with communication, I think is, is a really important trait to to feel, feel like, you know, anyone can come up to you and, and you just give them, give them what they need. Um, not, not beat around the bush, but just tell them how it is. Um, obviously different people respond to things differently. I think I think that's really important in a leader and a coach is to to be able to read a person and what's gonna work for them um, yeah. and tailor that. So yeah, you might speak to one person differently than another um, just because you know the person. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest, most important thing that I think makes people really good. Um, yeah. Really good leaders, really good coaches is, is they know how people tick and they know how to get the best out of them. Yeah, awesome. Um, what's next for you? What's next? Um, big game of cricket tomorrow for the, the mighty Perth Demons. Uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully a couple of good wins and finals cricket um, here in WA and then hopeful to, to get a, get over to the UK in the, um, in the off season here and hopefully playing the T20 comp. So, yeah, there's a bit bit of water to go under the bridge there but um, that's something that I'm really excited for and again for me that's a really important part if, if I am gonna you know ever represent Australia that's that's probably a, a key part to it to, to keep me playing cricket at that level and give me a chance to put some performances on the board so um, fingers crossed that yeah. all goes ahead and I can get over to the UK and and play over there. Excellent and now final two questions we ask all our guests why do you play cricket? Um, yeah, I think the enjoyment factor, um, and there's been times throughout my career where I haven't enjoyed it and it's gone bad. We've spoken about the, the lows, um, you know, being, being cut and being dropped and there's been plenty of lows, but, um, once you get back to just enjoying it, that's, that's when you do, I, I guess, realize why you play the game and, and lots of friendships from playing cricket. A lot of my mates are cricketers, um, and yeah, just enjoy you know, being around a group of mates and at the end of the day you're all working towards the same thing and if you have team success obviously that makes it that much special, more special but um, yeah just the challenge I think when you do succeed um, it's, it's really rewarding because it's a hard game and there's, there is lots of failures so um, the days that you do um, have a good day I think they're, they're really rewarding. Um, and very challenging, so yeah. Yeah. Now, what's your definition of success? Tough question. Um, for me, success would be, I guess, having reached your full potential. Um, I think if I could finish playing and say, you know, I made a good fist of it, and I, I felt like I reached my full potential, then I'd probably say that I was had a successful career. Um, like we've mentioned, I didn't do that in shield cricket. Um, and that's probably the hardest thing to swallow for that was I never quite felt like I performed as well as I should have. Um, but yeah, I've got an opportunity still in white ball cricket, I guess, um, to try and see how far I can go and hopefully whenever that finishes, I can look back and if I can get to that point and say, um, yeah, I think I got the best out of myself, then that's that's probably how I'd measure if I'd been successful or not. Awesome, well, I think you're pretty close to uh yeah, you've done very well, you've had a great career and you should be proud of what you've done so far, but hopefully there's plenty more to come uh, with it. So, Wellesie, thank you very much no for worries. your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Um, hearing more about your story, how can our audience sort of stay up to date or follow you? Is it uh, Instagram? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, just 
social media. Um, probably more Instagram for me. Don't tend not to be on Facebook too much. Um, so yeah, probably Instagram. Yeah, There's cool. cricket mentoring. Look after me on there down at, <laughs> down at the PCC. So yeah. We'll, uh, we'll put a link to your account on the show notes. So thanks a lot for that. And I'm sure everyone has got a huge amount of value and, and well done on everything you've done. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.